So welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's uh, nap time, coffee time. We'll try to keep you entertained. Um, immunotherapy, it's uh, all about helping the body to recognize or attack or not attack, down, down, uh, down, down regulate um, over uh, stimulation of the immune system. So it's really how, how can we facilitate um, the immune system to cure disease or treat disease. And we've got a couple of different approaches here um, with us on the stage. I think um, each, each of the, the panelists will talk about some of their experiences, but we'll also talk about uh, the industry as a whole. And maybe that's one of the places uh, where we can start. Uh, but first, I want to introduce everybody. Um, Aram is uh, on the end there. He's the CEO of Noxon. Um, he'll tell us a little bit more about Noxon's approach and technology during, during the panel. Um, Peter has um, founded and is CEO of, i say the name of the company so I don't mess it up, Ex Ex Accelerate. Um, and is a former CFO of Medigene and also was involved in the turnaround of, of Wilex. Um, and Stefan Boissel next to me is a CEO of Tixel. Um, so Peter, maybe you could start, just give us a, a little bit of background on where the industry is today. There's been a lot of excitement lately with the approval of the third checkpoint inhibitor from Roche, with PDL, PDL1. Um, and there's also been a lot of excitement about CART T. Um, the valuations of those companies are absolutely astronomical. And if you look at some of the projections for the commercial potential, if you just take ALL, which is maybe one of the only places where there is real clinical proof of concept, it, it seems impossible that the valuations could be justified where we are today. Um, and there's not a lot of proof that we can actually get into solid tumors yet with, with these and other types of cancer with these technologies. But that's what would have to happen in order to make those valuations really uh, realistic. So, Peter, tell us a little bit about your experience in, in turning around Medigine, the financing, and the environment uh, today. Sure. Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, yes, uh, Accelerate Partners, we focus on turning around business models, which are a little bit difficult. And Medigine was certainly such a case when Medigine, three and a half years ago, with a market cap of 25 million euros, with a few products, unfinanceable at the time, managed to ride the hype of immunotherapy in acquiring a startup company um, with, let's be honest, 25,000 euros of cash on the balance sheet and 17 scientists and accumulated 150 years of immunotherapy experience. These guys were buzzing. Yeah? And so we acquired this company. And all of a sudden, we were able to raise 65 million euros over two years and increase the market cap up to over 200 million euros. Not just because of that, obviously, but because we recreated the equity story. And um, I was also on the board of Immunicor, who, as you know, also raised $330 million, the largest private raise <coughs> in for a biotech company in Europe based on immunotherapies. So um, my view on this is that the capital being provided for this technology is totally unwarranted and the initial valuations do not agree with the science provided. And I know the two here who uh, might not agree with me here, but certainly this is all based on hope. And if you look like a company like Juno and Kite, which didn't exist five years ago, they have a combined market value of $7 billion. And they have a few products in phase one and phase two. Guys, I don't get it, but perhaps someone else can explain that to me. Well, there is there is precedent for this. I think we've seen it before with genomics, and uh, maybe also in the gene therapy space. Uh, so, I think the excitement 
is really there. And, and as, as my boss said in, in 2000, when I was working at a hedge fund in New York focused on genomics, he said, the valuations today are where they should be in five to 10 years. And it was really the markets get ahead of themselves. So I think it's sort of normal and it's been an opportunity for some companies to take advantage of that in terms of, of financing. What do you, what are you guys experiencing? Well, I, I have to say not all companies. Uh, um, certain companies and especially in the US are uh, clearly, uh, um, I mean, I clearly have a very huge valuation today. I think valuation are much more reasonable in Europe. Um, for, for, for many different reasons. Uh, but uh, you also have to understand that uh, those technologies you are referring to, um, the, the CAR T players, are probably, let's say, two years from marketing, and they will make a huge difference in, in cancer, for which today there is clearly an unmet medical need. I mean, if you've seen the, uh, the, the data that were provided by, by, by UPenn and Novartis on, on their first trial in ALL, uh, patient recruited at this stage of the disease uh, will become, you know, refractory to uh, uh, any kind of treatment, chemotherapy, and so on and so forth. Enter those trials with maybe a, a six months life expectancy, and two or three years after, they were still alive, 90% of them. Uh, so that's that's fantastic, you know, result probably never seen before. Even with, you know, immune checkpoint inhibitors, antibodies, you, you have not seen that kind of difference in terms of uh, of response. So. Uh, yes, there is clearly a, a, a hype today. There is clearly a rich valuation. But at the end of the day, if these guys can address a, a few challenges that still remain, like manufacturing, like the kind of um, you know, pricing you could achieve for this kind of therapy, uh, that, put, that, that could become, you know, uh, in the next five to 10 years, as big as uh, what the antibody became over the last 15 years. I remind you that the antibodies 15 years ago, you were talking about rituximab and maybe a few others uh, in late stage uh, clinical development. Now you are talking about a business which is worth mil billion and billion of dollars. So uh, yes, you, you can question the valuation, but at the end of the day, again, if they can address uh, the challenge that they, 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 they have to address, uh, I, I really believe it will be a, a huge uh, success for the benefit of the patient and for the benefit of the investors. Yeah, and, 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 and I think uh, to add to that, it's not just the, the, the T cell therapeutics. Um, some of the, the, the more traditional medicines that target the tumor microenvironment. Um, uh, Pfizer recently released a study where they added uh, a tumor microenvironment modulator, a chemokine inhibitor, uh, on top of a standard pancreatic cancer therapy. And they had 97% of the patients uh, with tumor control, most of them stable disease. But for that population, it's, it's pretty astounding. So I think all across the board, you've, you're seeing the first hints that properly used, um, these new therapies can have, have a dramatic impact in places where before it was just utterly desperate. I think that's, for me, the key difference between this period of hype and the ones that came before. Uh, we're still waiting for the, the results of the genomic bubble to appear in terms of the promises <laughs> that were made at, at, during that period. So this is really um, a little bit different this time. It's not to say the valuations aren't a little yeah. bit over overextended. No, absolutely. And what, what gen the gentleman here said was absolutely correct. However, um, let's just envisage two scenarios. One is that the hope for the future actually p pulls through. Right? We get great data, and all of a sudden, this works, as you pointed out, it doesn't yet, in solid tumors as well. Then it's all justified. So what happens if just one of these guys have a little bit of doubt, dubious data? What will happen then? I'm not saying it will be bad for all of biotech, but it won't help. <laughs> Are you saying the dominoes will start to fall? Okay, let's, let's look at some of the challenges that, uh, that the industry has. I think um, you know, one of the things that we heard some discussion about this morning already with uh, gene therapy is, is also a problem here. Aram, maybe you have a different perspective because you're working uh, in a slightly easier area, right, with the Spiegelmers. Um, but maybe, Stefan, you can tell us a little bit about the manufacturing challenges 
um, that are faced not just by you but also other other uh, participants. Yeah, sure. Well, the 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 big difference with uh, with um, uh, let's say small chemical entities or antibodies is that you are dealing with um, uh, for cellular immunotherapy. I'm talking about cellular immunotherapy with uh, living cells, uh, and, and and sometimes, which is the case for the CAR T players, you do uh, you introduce genetic modification to a, a living cell. So it's a living genetically modified organism. So if you uh, let's say draw a chart or a spectrum of uh, what uh, what is easy to manufacture in, in in the biotech or pharma industry on one hand and what is the most difficult thing to manufacture on the other hand on one hand you will have aspirin on the other hand you will have uh, cellular immunotherapy and in the middle you will have therapeutic vaccine and somewhere uh, on the left hand side you will have antibodies so this is probably the the, the worst uh, uh, thing to be to be manufactured this is uh, uh, something that all players, uh, I mean, we are not I immune to it without playing on words. Uh, Novartis, as, uh, as, um, despite being a large company with um, uh, abundant resources, also had some problem. Kite, uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, had uh, one of their trials with clinical supply from a lab in NIH top because of manufacturing problem. Uh, so, yes, it's Currently, the biggest challenge is to make sure that because of the very nature of the product, uh, eventually we will find a way to have a robust, scalable uh, uh, process to manufacture that at, at a commercial scale. Because it's one thing to, to manufacture for one of the patients per year. It's a totally different thing to manufacture for thousands and thousands of patients. Uh, the logistics are, uh, are a nightmare. And uh, the processing itself is, uh, is, very, uh, is very complex. But that's the pessimistic vision. Uh, uh, I remember when I joined this industry like 15 years ago, uh, I was at uh, Inet Pharma and we were developing monoclonal antibodies. I can tell you at that time it was almost as difficult as what we are facing today with cellular you know, immunotherapy to find CMOs. Uh, with manufacturing capacity to do large clinical batches. And 15 years after, it's a commodity. So my vision on cellular immunotherapy is that if we all do what we have to do, and being all being the players, but also the equipment manufacturer, the CMO, and so on and so forth, in 10 to 15 years, that will be a commodity as well. How much, how much, of, the, how much of the risk um, do you think that your technical chance of success is on the product itself or on the, mar the manufacturing issues? That, that's, a, again, I'm talking about cellular immunotherapy. Uh, if you had asked me the question like two or three years ago, I would have told you that manufacturing had a probability of success below 50%. I would say now we are closer to 80 to 90%, but we are not yet at 100%. And for example, we are in phase 2B, uh, in, in Crohn, so nothing to do with, uh, with cancer. And uh, if you look at analyst report, uh, they assign a, a higher probability of manufacturing success than a probability of clinical success, uh, which was, uh, again, not exactly the case two or three years ago. Okay, uh, just briefly, and then I want to pass over to Aram, but just briefly tell us what your approach is since we haven't touched on that, so. You mean in terms of uh, manufacturing? Does, does no, no. Uh, the actual Oh yeah, no, no. We we uh, we uh, well, we come in a very hot space, which is uh, cellular immunotherapy. But we come. Uh, I mean, Tixel comes with um, an approach which is radi radically different from from the peers. The peers being Juno, Kite, and so on and so forth. In the sense that we are the only clinical stage company in the world to focus exclusively on a subset of T cells, which are called regulatory T cells. And those cells, they, they don't uh, stimulate the immune system. They, they do exactly the, 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 um, the opposite. So we, very naturally, we don't use those cells to fight cancer or infectious disease, because you need stimula stimulation of the immune system to fight those diseases. But we use them to fight uh, autoimmunity and inflammation, i.e. disease where you need to calm down the, the immune system. And again, this approach is, uh, is unique. And uh, to come back on your earlier comment on valuation, I can tell you we are very, 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 very far away from, from Juno and Kite. And the main reason being that there is clearly today a difference in uh, medical validation between the two approaches. But being a first mover, 
uh, we strongly believe that uh, if within the next two years we can score positive on, on the ongoing, uh, you know, randomized clinical trial that we are going to, to uh, conduct in Crohn, uh, maybe we won't reach that kind of evaluation, but at least we will come, we will come closer uh, to, where, to, to where they are today compared to where we are today. Yeah, Aram, uh, it would be great to know a little bit about Spiegelmer's. Are there any technical issues in terms of um, producing them, manufacturing them, uh, responses in the uh, immune system, I, 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 et cetera? I yeah. think on, on Stefan's uh, yeah. scheme there, we're pretty far on the left. It's, it's essentially oligosynthesis on a big scale. Um, so we actually have multiple CMOs uh, that, that we can talk to that are ready to scale up. We just have to get them the mirror image building blocks. So I think we're, we're, in, a, we're, in, a, we're in a different place. And in, in terms of um, the, the approach that you're taking to um, maybe make the micro environment uh, more accessible to other drugs that are in development, or can you tell us a little bit about what, what it is that you're trying to achieve with, with the sure. mechanism. So, so I think probably everyone's familiar with the checkpoint inhibitors now, the, the PD-1 or as you mentioned, uh, PDL one antibodies that are approved now and they, they attack the, the, this, this, these, these receptors that uh, are kind of a safety valve, if you will, for the immune system to shut down reactions that cancer is, of course, hijacked. So uh, the, the, the sort of uh, explan routine explanation is you, if, you, if you use these antibodies, you take the brakes off of the immune system, to use a, a, the analogy of a car. Um, it, it's, it's, of course, much more complicated than that being biology. You've got many other things that other factors. You've got things like IL-10 that will control proliferation of T cells within tumors. You've got factors like IDO that can uh, enhance the, the, um, the, the regulatory T cells uh, activity in tumors. So it probably is true that one, one approach is not going to fit all of them. Uh, where we're looking is at, is at the trafficking of, of some of the effector cells, uh, like the T cells, so the, the, the engineered T cells, which I think have, have proved uh, uh, that, that they, they're, they have very high potential, um, but also important for the checkpoint inhibitors, because if you can, you can take the brakes off of a killer T cell that's going after the cancer, but if that, that cancer, or that T cell can't actually infiltrate into the tumor, it can't do its job. Um, so there was some pretty un, un, underappreciated work done in the early 2000s uh, by, by a few different people um, looking at what's the reason for this. And it turns out that some of the chemokines that normally attract cells uh, have the opposite effect on killer T cells under the right conditions. So they can actually act as chemorepulsives. So they, they push these killer T cells out of uh, out of the solid tumors, effectively acting like a wall. Um, so, our uh, our approach is to try and break down that wall. Uh, we, 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 as I mentioned earlier, we physically destroy these gradients when we give our drug. And so, the hope is that, uh, and when we've seen this with uh, with preclinical work, that. When we disrupt this wall, we'll increase the influx of, of the appropriate T cell populations and, and NK cell populations into tumors, uh, and that may have an effect on its own. But when you couple that with agents like checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and we, we're very curious to look at things like CAR Ts and engi engineered NK cells as well, the hope is we can, we can dramatically increase their efficacy. And, and in some of the tumors where these approaches don't work, we hope we can make them effective. So you may, you may be helping to bring some of the CAR-T approaches out of only liquid uh, cancers into solid cancers. It, exactly. It appears that, that the target we're going after for one of these CXCL12 is, is, is one of the key exclusion factors for, for T cells in, in some of these solid tumors. Great. OK, thanks. So um, maybe we could pass now to regulatory pathways. Um, and talk about how, uh, since none of these products are approved, uh, unlike an antibody 
uh, therapeutic, which is manufactured one antibody for everybody. Uh, often, uh, these are autologous therapies, so the manufacturing is one drug per patient. <laughs> Um, so how does that work in terms of the approval process? And this is something that is unknown territory um, and uh, being pioneered right now. Obviously, the efficacy justifies that or you know, tells us that this, there will be a solution for this, um, but there, it's, it's pretty unclear. So I don't know if um, we could maybe have a summary of where we are right now and then what, what some of the challenges are. Do you want to start, Peter? Yeah, sure. Um, just from the technology from Medigene, um, Medigene has three approaches. One is uh, the use of dendritic cell vaccines uh, to go for the smaller tumors and mineral residual disease. Uh, T-cell receptors, these are natural ones, not engineered, uh, to go for the larger tumors. And the idea here is to build an enormous library of millions of T-cell receptors to attack the tumor. And I have to admit, these are all in very early stages. But to answer your question, um, the biggest challenge for any company is the cost of manufacturing. And it's not just the cost of manufacturing itself, but as you said, it, this is patient specific. And it means to what price and which price are you prepared to provide this, uh, this treatment? And how much will it cost to do? And as you can see, there's one really good example of that it didn't work, and that's Dendrin. And Dendrin, I know, used a different technology, but they decided that they would set up their own distribution system. And I spoke to the, one of the manager of Dendron a couple of months ago, and I said, listen, why didn't it work for Dendron? He had such a great technology. And he said, look, we were spending more for FedEx than we were on actually producing the drug. And in the end, what they were doing, they were employing interns to fly the product through the world. And that really is not the way to, to solve this issue. I mean, to stay on uh, cellular immunotherapy and to come back to your um, question on regulatory, there is uh, in Europe uh, and in US, there is also a, 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 let's say a specific section of the FDA dealing with, it, with that kind of product. But in, in Europe, they have created a few years back the uh, ATMP, uh, Advanced Thera Therapeutic Medicinal Product, which is dealing with uh, this kind of um, uh, autologous or even allogenic uh, approaches as long as uh, you are dealing with uh, a cell Based uh, 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 product, so you you speak when you speak to the regulators to a specific uh, group that is used to deal with uh, ATMP, and they follow uh, you through the whole uh, through the whole process. Uh, so that's that's clearly a much better environment uh, than uh, for people who are doing cell therapy 10 or 15 years ago because. We have to understand that we have been doing cell therapy for years and years and years, and it became fashionable only a few years back, uh, thanks to spectacular data. But people have been doing cell therapy for you know 30 years with T cells. Okay, uh, so that's that's new and that's that's very good. And the environment is very favorable. Uh, uh, the regulators in Europe and in the US they take a very uh, um, uh, a close look, uh, but uh, a very positive look to this kind of approaches given the clinical benefits. Uh, but I will then come back to the same issue when they look at the dossier, uh, the, the core uh, to, their, to their work is uh, obviously manufacturing. Um, you know, our products are manufacturing, what kind of QA and QC environment are we dealing with? And if you have to change site, uh, then you have to do it all over again. So this is uh, uh, clearly a, a very uh, specific uh, focus for the regulators in the US and in Europe because of the classification as ATMP, you have to manufacture under GMP constraint uh, even in phase one, which again, if you, have not, if you don't have this classification, uh, you can manufacture in an hospital lab, for example. Uh, so, and I, I have to say for, for, for that respect, Europe is probably more stringent than the US in terms of uh, uh, the GMP requirements. Um, so, uh, so the Spiegelmer platform, as I mentioned, the, the manufacturing itself is, is relatively straightforward in terms of the chemistry. Um, un, I, th I think, again, we're, we're quite on the opposite end of the scale in that, that you know, the experience we get from one Spiegelmer, we just change the sequence and you know, we can apply the, the, the improvements in process chemistry from one molecule to another. Um, and I think this is, that's the advantage of 
of chemical entities. Um, and we, we actually recently switched uh, manufacturers because one guy didn't have a, a slot early enough for us. So we, uh, we were, it's something you're able to do, I think, much more easily in the, in the chemistry side. Can you tell me, make me dream, uh, a tech transfer in your industry, how long it takes? <laughs> a tech transfer to a new CMO? <laughs> we it's a matter of weeks? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> For cell therapy, we like to say it's 12, 12 months. When we decided to change the manufacturing strategy at Tixel, we had our own pilot site, and we decided to close it and then to move Fabless. So we outsource everything to a CMO. We, we did it in a record time, six months. Uh, but because we have invested a lot of money and because we had, uh, you know, uh, space at, at the facilities uh, and, and resources, but usually it takes a lot of time. It's surprising, really, because if you think about it, there aren't enough actually to, to produce. There aren't enough to actually specifically produce, right, in your, in your field, right? Whereas in cell therapy, there are loads, yeah? But they don't specifically work. What do you mean? Uh, Manufacturing. Oh, CMOs? Yeah. yeah, you have a lot of CMOs, but uh, most of the CMOs are, um, I mean, are not able to, uh, they're not scalable. I mean, they manufacture small batches. And, and uh, moving from lab scale to, um, I mean, phase one, and then from phase one to phase two or phase three, uh, you are, you know, changing. Um, Totally, you are totally changing universe. You are moving from uh, 10, 15 batches, uh, and a, a patient is one batch, uh, to 100, 150 batches, and that's a totally different scale. Uh, and that in Europe, uh, maybe two or three CMOs are capable of doing it, and in the US, maybe as well, two or three uh, CMOs are capable of doing it. So we can ask uh, some questions from the audience? Yes. Please. There have been a number of partnerships with CRISPR companies or companies focused on CRISPR and immunotherapy companies. How do you foresee this causing um, an expedition of the product to market and also maybe a decrease in cost of the manufacturing or will it be the inverse and slow things down and increase costs? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, clearly, uh, this is something that we are carefully looking at. Uh, you have to understand that uh, CRISPR technologies are maybe uh, two or three years away from clinics. Uh, so today, it's a lot of speculation. Uh, it's a lot of speculation in terms of uh, manufacturing and so on and so forth. Uh, so um, uh, uh, it's impossible to say whether it will have an impact on, on, on COGS, or uh, at least I'm not qualified to say whether it will have an impact on COGS uh, uh, or on manufacturing process. Uh, the way I see it today is that it will only add complexity, okay, from that respect. But it will bring so much, you know, in terms of what you can do with the cells that uh, we, just, we just have to invest in the technology and we just have to massively invest in the technology because this is the future for our approaches. And I'm not differentiating CRISPR to talent and so on and so forth. I don't want to enter into that debate. I'm talking about gene modification in general. Maybe you have a, for Medigen, you have maybe a different perspective? Yeah, I mean, the question is, what's the point of doing a partnership if the investors say, look, guys, don't dilute your technology? I think that was one of the biggest things we realized in, in the financing rounds, that the investors said, look, if you need money, just talk to us first before you go out and sell your silverware to a uh, deep-pocketed larger company. And Immunocore is totally different because Immunocore needed these deals to fund the co-development of the product. Hi, this is uh, primarily a question for uh, Stefan and Aram. I'm, I'm curious to know if there's anything that makes the phenotype of running an immunotherapy company significantly different from another company in the space. Like, in your experience, are there things that are very different, or is it generally the same? But uh, feel free to jump in, Chris and uh, Peter. I'm not sure to uh, understand the question from a management viewpoint. Oh. 
Well, uh, I started in immunotherapy 15 years ago, as I was saying. I can tell you at that time we were like aliens when we were talking to investors or industry players. The good thing about running an immunotherapy company today is that people are listening to you and, and people are suddenly become very excited when you start to say CAR-T, immune checkpoint inhibitors, immunotherapy, which again was not the case at that time. I mean, I listed the innate on the Euronex in 2006. It was only the third biotech company listed in Paris at that time. And we were talking immunotherapy. Uh, at that time, there was not a single immunotherapy product approved. And the first that got approved, or the first for which BMS started to generate some significant clinical efficacy data was like five or six years after uh, Yervoy. So uh, again, today, today it's, it's not difficult to attract talent. It's not difficult to attract uh, uh, partners. And it's not uh, difficult to attract uh, uh, money when you have uh, when you are in immunotherapy and of course if your if your science and if your technology makes sense. Did I answer to your question? I mean, in in, in fact, uh, uh, something I see a bit is if I, if I go out and of course we've we've come from the platform perspective and, and moved more towards immunotherapy. It's, uh, it, it's, it's almost viewed with a bit of cynicism by some investors and they say, oh God, not another immunotherapy company now. So, like it can it can cut it can cut both ways. I think so this is why we come with an approach which is radically different because we don't do cancer; we do autoimmunity and inflammation. Yeah. Another question. Uh, just looking in particular at the oncology field, if you're a young uh, startup and you have a novel small molecule or a novel toxin, is there any point starting? In 10, 20 years, what's the panel's view? Would it all be immunotherapy and the only treatments and cures available? Or is there still room for uh, alternatives? Um, perhaps I can translate that because uh, you, you just said something which is really interesting. When you go and see investors, they say, oh my God, not another immunotherapy company. And they be, they've started really to sift between the ones who are really innovative and the ones who are not, who just said, oh, in, uh, immunotherapies are a big boon. Let's join the hype and call ourselves immunotherapies as well. So in the end, I think uh, I, there will always be room for innovative technology. It doesn't matter in which field or whatever. It's just the hype of this particular term, which we all hope will be the f therapy of the future. And whether you are in cancer or, or in other disease, the, the, the key for the future is combination. And, and um, I mean, you start to see active and passive immunotherapies being combined together. Uh, you start to see active immunotherapy, like therapeutic vaccines, being combined with chemo. Uh, so, I mean, it's not for tomorrow that there will be one single treatment that will cure cancer. You know, it will be a combination, and very importantly, it will be a combination specific or tailored for a patient. That, that's the future. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, and I think even even our approach, we're we're always combining with a cancer killing regimen, and so you need you you need that if you're modulating the microenvironment, you need something to damage the tumor cell, and I think one of the most, in fact, one of the most dramatic preclinical models we had was combining with radiotherapy, you know, which you, you can you know is one of the most basic, uh, if you will, primitive ways to kill cells. Uh, but but here when we we come we treated uh, animals with radiotherapy and then blocked their access to the microenvironment we saw tumors disappear. So it you know I I can only second the view that you'll get you know you, it's going to be a long time before uh, we say yeah, we can throw everything out in the trash uh, except immunotherapy. At, at the end of the day, a good product is a good product, right? So. I think that's really the question to ask. So it's, uh, it's always good to take advantage if you have some way of being part of a trend because, as, as we said at the beginning, there's more capital available to companies that can check that box, immunotherapy. Right? That's but, true, yeah. yeah. Because in particular, I met an investor last week and he said um, that they're, they're slimming down in the immunotherapy field because they've put all their eggs in that basket and they're trying to make sure that they're, no, they're de-risking their portfolio. Yes, please. Um, 
Hello. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, pharmacodiagnostic approach. Do you have already uh, yeah, collaborated with diagnostic companies to combine your therapies with a diagnostic test for the personalized medicine? Is this still ongoing or what is the status? Um, the, 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 the nature of the targets we've gone after um, uh, are, are such that we don't, we don't use those um, because the, the targets are really, if you will, um, homeostatic factors that the, the, the cancer is hijacked and so they're, they're present pretty much everywhere. Um, I know that, that people are looking very carefully for the checkpoint inhibitors for the, the PDL1, for example. Um, but that's not something we, we've been doing uh, with our therapies. Uh, same here, actually. We, we have, uh, we have, uh, we have potencies assay. We, we are developing biomarkers, which are not intended to be um, regulatory biomarkers. But the idea, at the end of the day, is to be uh, producing for all patients, but then charging to payers only for patients for which that work. And you see that live, actually. It's, it's, a, it's actually a great question because there was, I think yesterday in Nature, an article that they were finding that variants of the PD-1, PD-L1 uh, genes are responding much better or, or much worse to the checkpoint inhibitors. So probably uh, we'll be seeing that coming up even in you know, the, the sort of the broader indications, what we thought were broader indications. Things are more complicated than they seem. Yeah. So um, cancer immunotherapy is quite an expensive um, treatment, especially when it comes to cell therapy and engineered cells. Do you think this will ever be a treatment for all patients? So how do you envision the reimbursement and, and who will pay for that in the end? So this is a critical point, I think, for the whole field. Uh, can you comment on this? Yeah, I mean, this is the next critical point after manufacturing, clearly. Uh, and today, um, even uh, big companies like, like Novartis, I cannot speak for them, but I, I read what they say, and they say, well, we are still thinking about how we are going to charge for the, for, for, for the product. And it's not only a question of pricing. Uh, there is this whole debate of uh, whether this is a product or a service, for example. You know, whether you should charge on an annual basis uh, uh, on a vial basis and so on and so forth. So uh, there is still a lot of questions. Uh, some of them will be answered within the next two or three years for cellular immuno, uh, immunotherapy. Uh, but um, today, um, there is not a single answer. I think it's a great question, but it opens up a whole new barrage of new questions, you quite rightly said. And that is the regulatory pathway. That is not just the manufacturing, but most important, the treatment. How will the patient be treated, treated in future? Because this opens up a whole new area of treatment methodisms. And, and I think the question can't be answered at this moment in time. Everybody hopes that the manufacturing and the production will be so inexpensive because there will be new economies of scale with this industry that it can be reimbursed. But I don't think it's an issue that anyone can answer right now. Yeah, and it's not just a question for the, the cell-based therapies, uh, because when, when you start seeing some of the, the innovative uh, patent-protected drugs for cancer, they're charging, you know, 10,000 euros uh, a month. Uh, so when you know that you're going to start combining drugs, uh, and in combining the patient is going to get a longer benefit, then not, not only do you, do you multiply the amount per month, you increase the number of months or years under, that they're under therapy. So, yeah, it's pretty clear that from the cost point of view, it's going to be extremely difficult for the healthcare systems to absorb that. Um, and they're, they're going to have to think about different models like service uh, and, and you know, maybe bundle pricing for combinations. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole range of different options. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a vexing problem that I think uh, it's fair to say yes, we, we don't have a clear answer to today. So thank you very much. Uh, time is up.